So Mr. Ganjan Bagwa, who is the managing director of the India practice of Amrit, and he's a trusted advisor to major international organizations, such as Boeing, Bose, Clorox, DigiKey, Medtronic, which is COVID, I didn't realize that, and Roche, and some of the and others on their, on their Indian or India initiatives. Ganjan is also the author of a book called Doing Business in 21st Century India, which is very topical, and has written many articles about India for the Harvard Review. So Ganjan, I'm gonna, before I turn it over to you, Ganjan, Kathleen, do you wanna say any couple of minutes about etiquette or how you wanna conduct this, yeah. please? Yeah, so um, I think um, I just wanted to update everybody. The sessions are gonna be recorded and they will be available um, from the IERG website following the event. Um, please mute your microphones when you're not speaking. Um, now, Gunjam has asked that this be a very interactive discussion. Since there's only 30 people on the call, we should be able to have questions come up interactively, correct, Gunjam? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and if you have questions and Gunjan is in the middle of something, you can drop them in the chat and Layston will be keeping track of that. Um, the, just be mindful of background noise when you're not speaking. And, um, and then uh, now I will move over to Gunjan. Thank you, Kathleen, uh, John, Layston. Uh, and uh, can you leave my background up for a moment, Kathleen? Uh, oh, I just sure. have a, yeah. So I hope people can see the picture behind me. Uh, and uh, about seven years ago, I was in New Delhi along with a major client who had been trying to win business from a large government owned company in India. They had been working on this for about three years. And they, many times they, they were, they felt they were within days of getting the contract and something would come up. And on this particular occasion, the client was quite frustrated because the government owned company had unexpectedly asked them to deposit about $50,000 uh, as, a, as a, a kind of earnest money into the State Bank of India on Parliament Street in a particular branch. And this company uh, is US based, although the individual was based in Asia, they had never done anything like that. And they said, well, if you're gonna put money in, into, into some kind of deposit, it has to be a bank in Singapore, we can't do it in India. And they were at this uh, impasse and I tried to persuade them that the business was near at hand and the risk of uh, losing this money was next to zero, uh, but they just weren't, you know, facts and data wouldn't convince him. So I said, okay, let's take a little bit of a side trip. Uh, we were in New Delhi and some of you are dialed in from India. So you might recognize the spectacular building in the background. Uh, it is the Lotus Temple. And uh, I took him there. It was the middle of the afternoon. Um, there were not many people there. And he was quite struck by the building. It looks, you know, like it might have been something built by the, the Mughals, you know, a few hundred years ago, but it's actually a very modern building. It was inaugurated in 1986. And it is a temple, it's not a Hindu temple, it's not Muslim, it's not Christian, it's not Sikh, not all the religions you normally think about when you when you consider India. It's actually a temple built by a very small religion called the Baha'i faith. And the interesting thing is that you will notice uh, there are no straight lines in this entire building. Everything is a curve. So after he was done admiring the building and its magnificence, I said, just look at the curves. And in India, success often doesn't come in a straight line. It often comes in a curve and sometimes it comes through a curve ball as well. And you just have to go with the flow when you deal with a country like India. Uh, and somehow the time spent in this temple looking at this magnificent structure kind of opened him up and 
you know, within three days, they actually put down that deposit. And three months later, I got an email from him that they had won that business. But it's more interesting now, I just talked to him a week ago, and they've actually gotten over $3 million of business from that client over the years. So it's actually turned out to be a very profitable client for them, but they were on the edge of walking away from this opportunity. So I, I just wanted to illustrate that point about India before I started out my presentation. And Kathleen, can we go to the next slide? So just to continue along that theme very briefly, uh, when you travel to India, I don't know how many of you have been there. I know some people are dialed in from India and some people are of Indian origin. But one of the messages I take, I take along for my American clients visiting India for the first time or clients from Canada or other countries uh, who have dialed in is that you have to look carefully beyond the initial reaction you might have to something. And there are three pictures here. I'll only take, I'll only illustrate one of them. And then if at the end, if we have time, Kathleen, we can go back to the others. They're all very puzzling photos. And I've illustrated the puzzles, you know, on the top left. But look at the one that says the Palmyra tenements. Okay. If you look carefully below that, it says resorts and accommodation, right? I found the, I found this uh, sign on the way from Bangalore to Mysore. Uh, on the outskirts of, uh, of this city called Mysore in Southern India. And, and the first reaction as an American you might have is, well, you know, I mean, most Americans associate the word tenements with, you know, low end project housing that, you know, uh, in New York or some other cities like that, right? And so your first reaction as an American visiting India might be, well, Indians speak English, but they don't know English that well. And somebody picked up the wrong word and you know, they put, they, they're calling this place, which is a resort, you know, and they're using the word tenements and it's incompatible, right? And that was my first reaction as well. Uh, but I have learned to be humble when I traveled to India. And so I looked up the meaning of the word tenements and actually the original meaning of the word tenements was simply multi-unit housing. It didn't have the color of low end project slum housing associated with it. Okay. Now in the United States in the late 19th century, as we started building these tenements in New York and they became associated with a certain kind of housing, the word took on a new meaning here in the US, but that's not necessarily true in the rest of the world. Okay. So my message again is that you've got to look beyond what you see on the surface and you might find uh, a new meaning and perhaps something that is more valuable to your business pursuits. We will talk about the other two pictures at the end if we have time left. Uh, Kathleen, could you go to the next slide, please? So India is not what it seems on the surface at many levels, you know? So people, uh, you know, there's this famous book called, uh, you know, kiss, bow or shake hands, you know, which tries to describe how you deal with different cultures, okay? And people ask me that question very often, you know, about what's the right way to greet an Indian? Well, I'll be darned if I know, look at the picture on the left. These are two Indians greeting each other, okay? And this is all pre-COVID times. There's another story after COVID, but you know, one has his hands folded together in a namaste pose and the other guy is offering his hand to shake hands, okay? India is a complex society. It's many different cultures, religions, socioeconomic strata, and P Indians often don't know how to deal with Indians. Okay? Indians often don't know all of the magnificent changes that have happened in their own country in the last 30 years. Okay, so my team in India is often surprised when we go after a particular project and we find a capability in India that they insisted three weeks before they started the project that that capability did not exist. And we can talk about some of those things as we go on. The, the flip side of that is that India is actually, actually very transparent. Unlike some other East Asian countries where you need to really have an interpreter from the local culture because you can't speak the language, the signals are unclear. You know, if you are a careful listener and observer as an American, you can be as, as good of an India expert as people say I am. Okay. The society is not closed to Westerners in that manner. 
Okay, and we can dwell more on that later on. Let me take your attention to the pictures on the right. So when I came to this country many years ago, one of the first things I learned was the definition of a standard American family. You know, husband, wife, two kids, a dog, and a picket fence. Right. That's how we imagine whether, of course, the reality is very different, but that's the stereotype in everybody's mind, right? Now, if you're an American marketer and you go to India with that idea, when people tell you that the Indian middle class is 300 million strong, and you are imagining, you know, husband, wife, you know, two cars, a picket fence and a dog, you know, the reality is actually very different. The reality looks very much like the picture on top in color, okay? There, there are three generations typically living in the same, under the same roof. You know, the, 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 the head of the household, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, the, that family, and then the adult children, and sometimes their children. Okay? That's not unusual at all in, in, in India. Some of that is changing in recent times with mobility as people are moving from one city to another, but this is still a very common form of, uh, of a family. Now you might say, how does that matter? Well, if you're selling products, I had a, a client selling you know, health supplements and we had to explain to them that you're not just selling to the mother about her, you know, to, to relating to her children. It's just as important to keep in mind the role of the mother-in-law in the family because the young mom is not going to do something, not going to put something in their kid's mouth uh, without consulting the mother-in-law. And you have to be aware of that logic in many, many cases. So uh, these, these factors play an actual role in your decision-making as you plan your market entry and you, as you plan your, your business in India. Can we move to the next slide? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to tell you three little anecdotes that you might not have seen I know on CNN or in uh, in your local newspaper or uh, or on your podcast and so on. I live here in California, where we are really the you know the breadbasket of America and in many ways the breadbasket of the world. And one of the products that is grown in the San Joaquin Valley are tree nuts, pistachios, almonds, walnuts. That graph that you see, don't worry about the details, but the red line is the sales of California almonds during 2020 month by month. And the other line shows the similar sales for the previous year. Well, today, India is the world's largest market for California almonds. And the sales rose dramatically during the, the pandemic. Uh, in 2019, Spain was the largest market and uh, it has been completely eclipsed by India. Uh, there are large orchards throughout the San Joaquin Valley who are servicing primarily Indian consumers. And anywhere in India where you go, you will find California almonds dominate the market. Okay? And this is not something you hear about in mainstream media. So let's look at the pictures in the center. Before you I move on, Gunjan, can I ask a question? Please. Why did, it, why did the um, sales grow so significantly during that period? And why do they appear to be dropping again? Do you know? Yeah, so the drop is simply a, a seasonal phenomenon because yeah. people overpurchased in that very sp steep spike you see that was leaving, leading up to the big holiday in India uh, in October called Diwali, where, uh, where uh, almonds are given as a gift, okay? Now they spiked during the pandemic because the thousands of years old belief in India is that almonds uh, give you immunity against disease. And it's very common. I grew up in a family like many middle-class families in India where at night you take a few almonds and you soak them in water. And then in the morning, uh, you know, along with your breakfast or along with a meal, you have those almonds, you know, your, uh, a small handful of almonds. Uh, and this practice as India has become more affluent, as the number of people in the middle class has grown, this practice has grown as well. And during the, the pandemic, people, the growth of all kinds of health and immunity supplements worldwide has skyrocketed, not just in India. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So thank, thanks for that question. Okay. Story in the middle is uh, very different. Uh, 
you know, one of the most respected companies in the United States for many years, of course, is IBM. And the joke in India today is that the I in IBM no longer stands for international, it actually stands for India. And two reasons, the more obvious reason is visible here, that their new CEO, Arvind Krishna, is actually an Indian American, a graduate of the same college where I went to school, the Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. But that's not the story I want to tell you. Okay. IBM now has more employees in India than they do in the United States. Okay. Now you can Google that all you want. You will not find any reference to this because this is a fact that IBM would rather not publicize. When they crossed 100,000 employees about 12 years ago in India, that, that they actually held a big deal. They did their stock analyst event in India and they wanted to highlight how they were leveraging Indian talent. But as the numbers continued to grow beyond that, IBM realized that this is not something that they wanted to share so widely. So our best estimates today are that IBM has at least 205,000 employees in India. Okay. Uh, and so it makes them one of the largest employers in India overall, uh, but certainly they have less employees in the US as their numbers have gone down here. Uh, and this is just one example. There are many, many other companies from the US who employ excess of 100,000 people in India. Hewlett Packard does, Oracle does. Uh, you know, Google and Microsoft may not employ that many people directly, but through their outsource partners, their total footprint in India of people working on projects for those companies would run in a similar, similar way. And many, many companies employ more than 20, 30,000 people in India, working on global projects, not just for the Indian market, but for, for initiatives all over. Okay, um, on the right is another story that I think many of you may not have heard of. The picture on the top is, is a fairly old picture of a man named Cyrus Poonawala. Now, uh, about a hundred miles from, uh, from Mumbai is a city called Pune, which used to be called Pune in the past. And Cyrus and his family uh, used to raise uh, race horses. Uh, you know, this happened as a result of their family from generations ago uh, helping the British with their with their uh, thoroughbred and, and other horses, uh, and then they they got into that business, and ultimately they got into the business of making vaccines for horses and ultimately vaccines for humans. Okay. Uh, the Serum Institute of India is the company that they run. Uh, Cyrus is about eighty years old now. They are the largest manufacturer of vaccines in the world. They make far more vaccines than Merck and Johnson and Johnson and Moderna and Pfizer put together. Okay. Early in the pandemic, they got a license from AstraZeneca to produce the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in India. And they are now shipping in very high volume. India has taken the step to use Indian vaccine, Indian produced vaccine as a diplomatic weapon. Okay. 49 countries have received the vaccine from India. At least 30 of them have received the initial shipments free of charge as a grant from India. Okay. These, these countries first included the neighbors, you know, uh, Bangladesh, uh, the island of Seychelles, Mauritius. Uh, but as of today, Mexico has received over a million doses, so has Brazil. The Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, made a call to, to the Indian Prime Minister requesting a supply of vaccines uh, coming into Canada. So in North America, the only country that has not received vaccines from India is the United States. Okay. Uh, and that, that may change, I'm not sure. Uh, the cost per dose of these vaccines from India is a fraction, you know, less than 10% of what the government is paying Pfizer and Moderna. Okay. So there's that factor as well. So on the left, we have a photograph of Joe Biden when he was uh, President Obama's vice president. And he traveled to India along with Dr. Jill Biden and landed in Mumbai, where he gave a famous speech uh, pictured at the bottom. Uh, this was speaking to at the Bombay Stock Exchange. And 
he touched upon a theme that the US India Business Council had first brought about. And at that time, the trade with uh, the bilateral trade between the US and India was about $100 million. And Joe Biden mentioned in his speech that, you know, there's not one of you in the audience here who doesn't believe that this trade can reach $500 billion. Now, at that time, the India's GDP was only about $2 trillion. So this is talking about, you know, 25% of the size of the Indian economy. So it seemed almost like an outlandish idea at that point, okay? Uh, but this is the kind of goal that, uh, that uh, Vice President Biden set about in India, and it actually captured the imagination of business people in both countries. And so you will see this theme repeated over and over again in the last, you know, whatever, uh, you know, six or seven years. Uh, the picture on top actually shows uh, Joe Biden visiting the uh, one of the labs at the Indian Institute of Technology at Bombay, and this young woman is gave him a tour of the work that is being done there. Um, now, since uh, Biden has become president, uh, there's been considerable interest in India, despite all of the attention that the administration needs to give to the economy and to the pandemic. Uh, in, Indians were quick to note that uh, Prime Minister Modi was among the first 10 people, the first 10 heads of state that received a call from Joe Biden. But what they were even more excited about was that Biden called Prime Minister Narendra Modi one day before he called Xi Jinping of China, you know, which is very, very, was very clearly noted, uh, you know, by Indian media and by people who watch these kinds of issues. So everything looks very good as far as the US-India business alignment goes. Okay. But I caution my clients that when you talk about uh, US-India alignment, uh, you know, one of the standard lines that people bring up, oh, we are, you know, we are the oldest democracy, you are the largest democracy, you know, we are tied together at the hip, we are such similar countries. Okay, I counsel my clients to not emphasize these points. They are true, India is the largest democracy. It's true that the US is the largest, you know, the oldest continuous democracy in the world today. Okay. But most Indians remember something that most Americans are unaware of. And when I use the word ugly, I'm not meaning to describe what Henry Kissinger looks like in this photo. He used to be a very handsome young man at one point. But in, in the late 1960s and early 70s, US policy was as anti-India as you can possibly imagine, and very much pro-Pakistan, which was not a democracy at all. Okay. The bottom, you see the picture of the USS Enterprise. This was the aircraft carrier, the first nuclear aircraft carrier built for the United States, and it was the lead ship on the US Seventh Fleet. Okay. In December, 1971, when India had a war going on, uh, over the liberation of Bangladesh, President Nixon and le led by advice from Dr. Henry Kissinger directed the seventh fleet to enter the Bay of Bengal. Uh, ostensibly, if you, again, if you look at the American news media, you will not find this. The story in the venerable New York Times says that the seventh fleet is being directed towards Dhaka to pick up American citizens who might be stranded there, okay? That was baloney. Uh, everybody knew about that. That was very far from the truth. The reason that the American military power was projected in the Bay of Bengal was to put fear in the minds of, uh, of Indians and, and uh, in the, the Indian military in particular. Uh, so things have changed dramatically from that point. And today, the two countries are very, very friendly, but the memory of this lives strongly in the minds of many Indians. So I counsel my clients to be respectful of, you know, of the history that, uh, you know, the very recent history, both countries were still the largest and oldest democracies, you know, in 1971, uh, you know, but the American attitude towards India was very different. I realize I may be making some of you uncomfortable. That is part of my purpose because success in India requires getting out of your comfort zone, okay? Uh, I'm very much pro US and India moving forward, but you have to recognize 
what the reality has been in the past. So today's India is a huge business opportunity for American companies. The picture on the left shows the top 10 industrial economies and India only entered the top 10 in 2014. Okay, you see the US has been the number one economy straight for, all, for a period of time and China number two. But the one economy that has been rising in the top 10 is India. You know, it's the yellow highlight and the graph that you see going up, okay? So if you haven't looked at India in the last two, three or five years, it's probably a good time to look at the opportunity that India presents today. The pandemic hit both the US and India pretty hard and trade dropped quite a bit. But the encouraging news is that in January of this year, the US-India bilateral trade is back at pre-pandemic levels. Even though the economies have not fully recovered, the trade between the two countries has. And the, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, has uh, uh, you know, um, a, a person responsible for the India chair, and uh, they put out a, quite a bit of interesting information. So the, the big graph that you see here on the, on the right uh, is uh, the US-India trade month by month uh, ending in uh, January, 2021, okay? You'll see both imports and exports dipped and then they rose again. The small graph at the bottom is very important as well because most people think of services as being uh, you know, primarily outsourced call centers and tech support from India. Okay. But American companies offer a tremendous amount of services to India. And so you'll see the graph, uh, the difference between the blue and the orange is not that much, right? There, there's a, the trade is in India's favor, but there's plenty of American services being offered to Indian companies, whether they are engineering services, architectural services, uh, you name it. Okay. Indians are large consumers, Indian companies and the government are large consumers of American services. So let's move on to the next slide. I wanted to illustrate this further by a couple of examples. So the Cummins uh, company is headquartered in Indiana and about 20% of their market cap is based on their business in India. They have almost 20 factories across the country. They make engines, they make generators. Uh, you know, they, they employ more than 20,000 people, mostly in manufacturing. This is a picture of their factory in Pune. Um, I wrote an article about manufacturing in India for the Harvard Business Review a few years ago and actually got to interview some of the uh, top management at the Cummins India business. So this is a picture that they had sent me. Um, but let's think about appliances. You know, if you go to Home Depot or your favorite, uh, you know, big box store and you want to buy a dishwasher or a, a you know, a, refrigerator, uh, even if the brand says uh, Maytag or General Electric, you know, chances are that you are actually buying a made in China product, okay? In fact, the General Electric appliance brand itself is now owned by Hire, which is a Chinese company, okay? But one company that has had great success in India is based in Michigan, Whirlpool, okay? Whirlpool uh, got into business in India maybe 20 plus years ago. And very soon their sales in India will reach a billion dollars. Now they make products that are designed using Whirlpool technology, but tailored to the Indian market. So at the bottom, you see this ad for a refrigerator and the headline is not talking about what's inside the fridge. It's really talking about, you know, better than inverter. India has historically has had unreliable power. So everyone protects their refrigerator with a power protection device that used to sit on the top of the fridge. And they have integrated that protection into the refrigerator so that the refrigerator doesn't fail when your power goes out, okay, and, uh, and, and malfunction. So uh, their entire philosophy around the, the way they sell washing machines, the way they sell refrigerators and water purifiers is very much tailored to the needs of the Indian consumer. And they've also experienced a boom, by the way, in 2020 in sales. So they, I think their sales went up about 12 to 15% last year. Kathleen, did you have a question? Uh, Layston was gonna read one for you, I think. Please. Yes, um, Nina uh, Woodard, who actually has 
Um, she mentioned that she lived in India for 10 years. Um, do you see any particular industry doing better in India than I assume other countries? That's what she meant. Any industry doing better in India than other countries? Then I guess if it, yeah, if, if Nina, you uh, want to clarify, feel free. Yeah. Actually, the question was about industries in general. Any industry particularly mm -hmm. effective in India taking off with either talent or products more effectively than another industry? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, it's a little bit hard to answer. I'll, I'll quote one of my good friends who does business in both countries and is very sophisticated about both countries. And he says, in general, in India, there's money everywhere you look. If you know how to do business, you can you can make money as, as an American in India in almost any sector. There's a few that are exceptions to that that I'll get into in a minute. But currently, this friend of mine is running a company where they are helping India digitize medical records. They are charging something like 50 cents per record to digitize. So that seems like a ridiculously low price, but the volumes are so high that he's, you know, this is an American company operating in India, okay, funded by American venture capital, but all of their work is being done in India for Indian customers. And they are actually growing fast and making money at that unit price, okay. So sectors that have done well, uh, you know, defense, uh, and I'll get into that. Uh, India is the largest buyer of defense equipment in the world. Uh, uh, medical devices, I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Consumer products, uh, uh, Indians love consumer uh, brands from the United States and many of them are doing extremely well. Uh, let me think of what else. Uh, the uh, uh, Anything related to energy and uh, I think we'll have some dialogue about that later on. Uh, the Some sectors where you cannot operate uh, are multi-brand retail, right? So, uh, you know, your Best Buy or Costco or Walmart cannot currently have a store in India that sells products to consumers with many different brands being sold inside the store. So Nike can set up a Nike store and Levi's can set up a Levi's store. And uh, Walmart Indies has stores in India, but they can only sell to small businesses for resale. They are not currently permitted to sell to Indian consumers. Why so is Nina, that? Oh, that? That requires another hour of discussion, Kathleen. Okay, that's all right. I'll the, schedule the, another session with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, there are many reasons. The simple one is that the Indian government wants to protect small merchants in India. Mm -hmm. Most retail happens in India in very small mom and pop owned shops, and somehow there is the fear that large sophisticated American retailers will wipe that sector out. Thank um, you. Uh, but yeah, we could have a more, you know, at the end, if you have time, I can, I can get into more detail on that, okay. but I wanted to limit it to Nina's broad question. Um, recently, the Indian government opened up insurance. Uh, insurance companies were only allowed to own 49% of an Indian company. That number has now been raised to 74%. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, we expect a lot of growth happening in that sector starting uh, starting April 1st onwards. Um, sectors that may not succeed uh, would, you know, really involve personal services being offered, you know, in America by American companies, you know, some of those things don't really translate, like real estate agents and so on, I would think, you know, but Broadly, the opportunity is across many, many sectors. Now, some are easier than others. Uh, so I'm not saying that, you know, you can just randomly jump into any business in India and succeed, but uh, the opportunity is pretty uh, secular, I would say, across industries. Is there another question we can take at this point, Leiston? Okay. So far bigger than uh, the two companies I mentioned earlier, uh, is the success of Boeing in India. And here I'm just highlighting some of their military aircraft. Uh, I'm sitting here in Southern California, about 20 miles away from Long Beach. 
And in Long Beach, California, they built the C-17. India bought, I think, 10 of them. So the Indian Air Force today is the largest operator of the C-17 transport aircraft with the exception of the US Air Force. So uh, uh, these planes have been extremely successful in India. And this followed, this is a transport plane. India also bought a, more than, I think, about $2 billion worth of the C-130J, which is made by Lockheed Martin, the largest transport aircraft uh, you know, ever produced. So they bought plenty of those as well. More, uh, more recently, uh, Boeing shipped uh, the Apache helicopters to India. And uh, part of the Apache is actually being built in India by Indian companies uh, for final assembly. Then they sell a modified version of a Boeing 737 to use in reconnaissance. And uh, the Indian Navy has bought a bunch of them. Uh, this was really initiated after the, uh, the attack uh, by, by Pakistani militants in 2008 uh, on the, uh, you know, in, in, in the city of Mumbai, uh, where uh, uh, these militants were able to take a small boat and land in, in really in urban Mumbai and go unnoticed uh, and, and then take over one of the most prestigious hotels in Mumbai. And this was over Thanksgiving weekend in uh, 2008. And by 2009, the Indian government had already placed the order for the Poseidons uh, to, you know, to help the Indian Navy monitor the Bay of Bengal and in, in, you know, the Arabian Sea more, more particularly. But these planes are also used uh, for overland monitoring. So you see a picture here of the, uh, of the P-8I. The P-8 is the plane that the US Navy buys. The I stands for India. And so it's somewhat modified. Uh, Boeing has also sold a bunch of civilian aircraft so I don't want to just point attention to the military aircraft, but uh, just wanted to, you know, to kind of highlight the big purchases that the Indian government has made. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, at Amrit here, we do a lot of work in the medical device sector. And so a company like Johnson & Johnson, which is in both pharmaceuticals and medical devices, actually sells over a billion dollars you know, in the Indian market. You won't find this number in their annual report, but by me being able to piece together their activities in India, we've been able to determine that, uh, you know, th that they are the most successful med tech company in India, but pretty much every other major company that has approached India in the med tech space has been successful to varying degrees. Uh, Medtronic, uh, which bought my client Covidian has been in India for many years. And just a few months ago, they announced that they were expanding the R&D center in Hyderabad. Uh, we actually helped build that R&D center initially uh, back uh, over 10 years ago for Covidian and then Medtronic took it over and now they are expanding it dramatically. We talk about GE. Now GE has probably 10,000 people working in Bangalore uh, for, for what they call the Jack Welch R&D center and a good chunk of them are working for the healthcare business. So you see here a picture of a product called the baby warmer used for uh, you know, neonatal uh, uh, situations. They call it the lullaby. It was designed and made in India by GE engineers for the Indian market, but they found that this is something that they can sell worldwide. So uh, it has acquired quite a bit of success in Europe and other parts of the world. On the right, I've listed a number of global companies that have substantial success in India. I would, I think I can say safely that they have uh, uh, over a hundred million dollars of sales. You know, most of the companies listed there. Some of them are not American as you will see, uh, you know, Fresenius, Carl Stores, Olympus, you know, they're Siemens, they are European and Japanese companies, but, but American companies dominate the overall medical device market in India, despite some fairly challenging conditions that they have to work in in that country. Let's move on to the next slide. I see some more questions coming through, so feel free to interrupt me anytime. Well, we do have a question here that, um, why are there not uh, many semiconductor manufacturer uh, working in India? Yeah, so uh, when you say semiconductor manufacturers, uh, 
many semiconductor manufacturers have large tech teams in India. So Intel, for example, has a very large tech team and uh, they've designed many microprocessors in India. So have many other companies, including some Chinese, Taiwanese and, and Japanese companies. Uh, I think what the questioner is asking, why aren't there a lot of semiconductor fabs in India, you know, factories that actually produce the semiconductors. And this question keeps coming up every so often. Um, so broadly speaking, a semiconductor factory requires a huge investment. You know, I, I don't know what the current number is. Last time I looked, it was about $2 billion. And the cost of labor is not that major a factor. Uh, the semiconductor business, you know, used to be based in the U.S. and then it moved to Taiwan and China and Korea. And for India to get into that game uh, in a business that is very cyclical today, as of this moment, there's a semiconductor shortage. You know, you hear about how we can't get enough cars made because they can't buy enough chips, and uh, so many industries are affected. But this industry goes through a you know, frequent boom and bust cycle. So historically, people have been unwilling to take such large financial risks to put up a semiconductor fab in India. Now, every so often I hear a big movement, oh, it's gonna happen. And these days, yes, I'm hearing that, it's gonna happen and maybe it will. But you know, some countries specialize in certain products and other countries in others. And as far as I'm concerned, if India never has a major semiconductor fab, it's not the end of the world. Uh, you know, I would love to see more semiconductor fabs here in the United States, given the risks that we have with, uh, you know, so much dependence on China. But uh, so I, I don't know whether we'll see a major movement there in India. Uh, it looks more promising now than it has in past such instances, but I, I don't know. I cannot, uh, I, I, I'm not terribly optimistic that that will happen. Does that answer the question adequately? I think so. Yes, I thank you. Okay. So on the next slide, I am going to start with a personal demonstration, right? So um, I'm, I'm surrendering my HIPAA rights here about confidentiality. And I'm going to show you this bottle. Uh, I, oh, for some reason. Okay, here. Okay. Zoom, Zoom doesn't, so this is, uh, I, I can tell you that I come from a family that has a history of hypertension. So my doctor has prescribed me something called lisinopril. Okay. And you can see a picture of it here, right? This picture here uh, on the top left of the slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, when you go to Walmart or you go to Home Depot and you want to buy something, Usually there's a very clear label that says made in China, right? So you can, you can identify where a product is made, but apparently this is not true of many industries. And so I call this really India inside, okay? So my doctor prescribes a medication, the Kaiser Pharmacy dispenses it and they put their own label on it. Their label doesn't require, to, require them to tell me where the drug is made. So I have to read if I want, you know, it says manufacturer Lupin Pharmaceuticals. Well, Lupin is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in India. Uh, they are known mostly for their tuberculosis drugs. Uh, they are the largest maker of tuberculosis uh, medication in the world, but they also make a number of other medications at US FDA approved facilities. And so to prove to you that it's perfectly safe, I'm actually going to take my medication for the morning. Okay. <laughs> How do we know that's really medication? Oh, now Let's you're get getting into yeah, exactly, exactly. Here's the bottle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the generic medications produced from India really uh, constitute the largest source of generic medications sold in the United States. So, any of you who are taking a prescription. Uh, if you look carefully at the label, you might find the name of the company listed. One of my other products says Aurobindo, which is another company that makes pharmaceuticals you know, in Southern India. 
And these are all facilities that are inspected by the US Food and Drug Administration. US FDA, in fact, actually has inspectors on staff in India. So they don't have to fly people from the US to conduct these, uh, these uh, investigations anymore. Um, the Indian government has launched a vigorous effort called Make in India, where they are trying to encourage India as an alternate source of manufactured goods. Uh, you know, as, as an alternate to China, and it's encountered you know some success in that uh, in that regard. So last year, you know, we all heard about how there was a huge backlog in terms of being able to procure personal protective equipment uh, in the wake of the pandemic of the COVID-19 pandemic. So at the same time, India had that same issue because they were importing most of their PPE from China. Well, they rapidly converted many of the textile manufacturers who were experiencing a dip in demand, you know, for for their uh, for their uh, uh, traditional clothing products, and they converted many of them to start making uh, personal protective equipment. And today, India has become the second largest supplier of PPE in the world. Most of it is consumed domestically but they're also shipping quite a bit uh, you know, to other countries uh, around, around uh, the region. Uh, the, uh, the last you know, administration imposed a tremendous amount of tariffs on Chinese goods. And while some of the benefits went to Chinese companies shipping goods out of Vietnam, so you've seen trade from Vietnam skyrocket to the United States, uh, you know, but the other beneficiary really has been India uh, across many sectors. And again, this has been something you don't see in the mainstream news, uh, but uh, uh, chemicals, specialty chemicals, uh, electrical machinery, uh, many other products uh, from India are now made in India at world-class levels. And you see that some of them are making their way into the United States. Uh, and that's why the bilateral trade is growing. You know, it's not just American exports to India, but also imports from India to the United States. Some of the activities that you see in US-India trade are not available to China, okay? Because of the, you know, the, the defense you know, category is one I described earlier, right? So, uh, you, you know, in, uh, Boeing cannot sell the C-17 or the P-8 you know, to China, but they can to India. And the other area where you see, you know, some very dramatic collaboration between the two countries, and this is not really a sourcing issue, uh, is, is the area of uh, uh, space exploration. So uh, here in Southern California, is, there's a project called the 30 meter telescope. You know, it's a large telescope that they intended to put on a top of a mountain in Hawaii and there's some controversy. I'm not sure where it's going to end up finally, but a big component, big piece of that telescope is being designed and built in India. Okay. Uh, it's a multi, it's a project involving many, many countries, uh, but India is a key participant in that, in that project. But the picture I have of here is another project called NISAR, which is a collaboration between the Jet Propulsion Lab here in Southern California and uh, India's Space Research Organization. It's the most ambitious, uh, uh, most uh, expensive remote sensing satellite to be launched. It's still being designed and built. And this is an equal collaboration between uh, the, uh, uh, the scientists and engineers at uh, JPL and the scientists and engineers working in India at, uh, at ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, just recently, I conducted a video interview of uh, General Larry James, who is the Chief Operating Officer of JPL. And those of you who are interested in learning more about this can uh, drop an email uh, to the address that Kathleen will, will provide, and I'll be happy to send you a link of, uh, to that video conversation. So this is work that has never been done before. Uh, so it's not low cost outsourcing to India. It's really a technology collaboration. Uh, this NISAR project had been contemplated for a long time at JPL, but would not have seen the light of day were it not for India to offer the launch services for this satellite and to actually build a big chunk of the instrumentation that will go on the satellite. So it will actually be launched from India 
on the polar satellite launch vehicle, uh, the PSLV, that India has also used to launch, launch its Mars and Moon missions. And this should happen in a couple of years. It's been delayed because of the pandemic, but uh, it will definitely happen soon. India supplies a tremendous amount of automobile parts, uh, batteries, radiators, uh, you know, other components uh, to the world, really. Uh, Honeywell ma manufactures uh, some of its uh, turbochargers that go into uh, automobile engines, uh, automobiles, and uh, they are made in, in their factory in Pune. They have another factory in Shanghai as well, uh, but I'm told the Pune factory has the bulk of the production going to Europe today. But I was struck by the news a couple of years ago that the Ford Motor Company decided that the SUV that they were producing for the market in India was at a level where they could add the US uh, pollution control devices and so on, and actually import it for sale into the United States. Uh, they were making this at their factory in Chennai in South India. And I know there's been recent talk that Ford is um, doing some joint ventures with an Indian company and may transfer the manufacturing to this joint venture. I'm not sure what they, where that stands, uh, but, uh, but certainly uh, it's probably the first automobile made in India to be sold in the United States. And again, you didn't see this in the mainstream media in the US for sure. Um, so I think that concludes the formal part of my presentation, Kathleen. Uh, you just want to bring up the next slide. We actually have two questions for you. Yeah. Um, from uh, like fr from the US perspective, um, from a strategic US perspective, is India an attractive market by itself or an attractive alternative uh, like hedge to China? So can you repeat the question? So um, from a strategic perspective for the USA, um, is India an attractive market by itself or really an attractive alternative to China? Yeah, so it depends on what the questioner means by the word strategic. You know, in policy <laughs> circles, strategic really refers to military and political collaboration. So from the lens of the Beltway in Washington today, India is very much seen as a counterweight to China. Okay. American policy planners are quite worried about the rise of China, uh, the rise of its military power, the fact that China has now virtually taken over Hong Kong, despite what they might say, the fact that China crossed the, the, the line of actual control with India in a couple of places, the fact that China is asserting itself in the South China Sea, uh, you know, the worry is that Taiwan might be under some threat at some point. And as the United States looks around Asia, you know, we see Japan as a potential partner, but Japan really doesn't have a strong military. Uh, we see Korea as a partner, but we have really supported Korea through, through our own military efforts in the United States. Uh, so who else are you going to turn to in terms of a partnership? And you know there is this creation called the Quad, uh, which consists of uh, you know countries uh, you know of Australia, which of course has tremendous trade with China, but is like currently going through a rethink of its dependence on China. And then you look at India. India has a long, long land border with China. The fact that I might, you know, without getting into too much politics, the previous president did not recognize or did not realize that we had that long border between India and China. Certainly the current president does. And uh, there are many factors that uh, India is concerned about relating to China. So yeah, from the strategic perspective, India is seen as a counterweight to China. India has a million man army. India has a Navy which is capable of projecting itself beyond the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. In fact, even during President Obama's time, this change took place where they began referring to that part of the world, not as the Pacific or Asia Pacific, but they used this very specific term which they invented called the Indo-Pacific. Okay. So 
currently in all documents coming out of the State Department and the Defense Department, you will see the insistence of the word Indo-Pacific as opposed to Asia-Pacific to emphasize the role of India and the role of the Indian Ocean you know, in, in uh, American strategic interests. Um, and this is very specifically directed at China. It's not so much pro-India as it is anti-China to be able to use that language. And you can see the reflection, if you look at Chinese documents or if you read the, the Global Times or even the South China Morning Post, you will see you know, uh, that the Chinese are offended by that language. And they think that it's, you know, it's inappropriate, but it's very measured and deliberate on the part of, of, of US strategy to use that language. So from a strategic perspective, yes, uh, the, the long-term worries in both India and the United States are uh, directed towards China, much more than Pakistan, frankly. Um, but if you just talk about the market, India is a strong market in itself. If you keep the defense side aside for a moment, really uh, India does not, you know, now China is a market for American companies as well, a much larger market today. However, China will not let Google function freely. China bans Twitter. China will not let Facebook function. Okay. China has limitations on American entertainment. Okay. None of those things are true in India. Right? So Twitter can function relatively freely. Uh, Facebook has its largest number of uh, users on WhatsApp are in India. In fact, they paid $18 billion to buy WhatsApp at a time when most Americans hadn't even heard of WhatsApp. And most of the usage was in India at that time. Okay. Uh, very soon, Facebook will have more users in India than they do in the United States. Okay. Uh, so India is a key market for not just tech companies, uh, but really companies all around. So yeah, uh, but I, I don't know how much time people you know, in, in Washington spend thinking about all of the aspects of the Indian market, uh, but it's really important to Indian into American companies, and more important than most American companies realize today. So, you know, I started my company more than 15 years ago, thinking that, you know, uh, that people didn't pay enough attention to India. Well, today I'll still say the same thing is true. Okay, people still don't pay enough attention to India. China gets way more attention uh, than than India does. The slides that I showed you at the very beginning of this presentation about the three three bits of news, you know, this should be common knowledge in the United States. I shouldn't have to say that this is news, okay. but it you know it's widely known in India, almost not not visible here in the United States. So long answer to that question. Uh, I have more slides yeah, which good. I can go into, but I'd rather uh, interact and then we can look at the rest of the slides if needed. Yeah, well, yeah. we've got a couple more questions that sure. Lisa mm -hmm. gonna read out, I think. Sure. Yeah, and I'll, I'll refer to you, Nina, to ask, uh, but this is an interesting um, anti-corruption question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, uh, Gunjan, I, was at, I wanted to know if you still, uh, I know India is working really hard on the anti-corruption perspective and they've been doing, I mean, even Bollywood stars do political or TV commercials about working against um, or looking at uh, how to clean up the some of the corruption. Um, but do you still counsel your clients about bribery and ethics in business and some of the differences between the U.S. market and the Indian market? Right. Uh, that's a very important point. And I'll give you, uh, Nina, you seem to have quite a bit of exposure to India. So I'll give you a nuanced answer to that. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, Anybody here in the US is governed by the American Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Okay, that applies to me, it applies to my clients. It applies to what I know and what I could or should have known. Okay, so I can't plead ignorance, you know, uh, as, as a way to get out of anything like this, right? So our strong advice to every American client is to follow the letter and spirit of American law when they function in India. This does mean that you will lose some business. Okay? There's some pieces of business you may not get, okay? But that's all right. Uh, in the long run, there is a much higher respect 
for American companies. And people in India have realized, generally speaking, that bribery doesn't get you very far when you're dealing with an American company. Okay, and and so while our European friends have to deal with this all the time, okay, it, it, American companies can be much more straight about this situation. Okay, so that's to me that is good news. Um, the second part of it that I will say is that for the current government, the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, it's been very different from the previous government under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and his last five years as Prime Minister, where many members of his own cabinet were accused and some of them ultimately imprisoned for large amounts of, of uh, corruption, you know, running into the hundreds of millions of dollars of personal wealth that they created as a result of their power. Not one member of Narendra Modi's cabinet has been accused of anything like that, okay? Um, now there have been many other charges that the government is pro-business and favors certain companies and so on. And we can debate that, but in terms of corruption inside of the prime minister's cabinet and the prime minister's himself, it has been pretty close to zero at this point. So that's all good news, right? Now, retail corruption at the small level in India is rampant, okay? And that will take time to change. It's changing because of a couple of factors. Number one, the very growth in India is, uh, you know, leading people away from corruption. Number two, the goods and services tax that has been set up where, you know, there's a trail for money that changes hands. And uh, the, you know, the value that that creates in terms of making it very inconvenient to hide money is also helping quite a bit, okay? But now let me get to the nuanced point, okay? Um, often we have a high and mighty attitude from the United States looking at India and saying, you know, it's a corrupt country, okay? When the Indians look at the United States, they see something a little bit different and we have to be respectful of that, okay? When you see, large American companies getting no bid contracts ranging into the billions of dollars, okay? Is that very different from what someone might call corruption, okay? When those companies are Halliburton, which used to be run by somebody who became vice president of the United States getting a no bid contract, you know, uh, what is that, right? You, you look at many other situations in the United States uh, where you can hire a K Street lobbying firm, okay, pay them millions of dollars, and all of a sudden you start getting business from, you know, from the government, okay. Uh, you can make you know, large donations through PACs and through individual contributions to political candidates, and all of a sudden you start getting their favor, you know, the the B1 bomber famously was assembled in 49 of the 50 states because, uh, you know, various congressmen and senators wanted a piece of it built in their state, okay? Uh, was that the most efficient way to make such an important product in the United States? Perhaps not, you know? So we, you know, we all, we all have our own forms of adapting, you know, between business and other needs. And so I, I tend to be, you know, much less critical of what I see happening in India given some of these factors. And I promised in the beginning that I would make some of you uncomfortable. So uh, I hope I'm keeping up my promise on that, but success in India requires that humility and that acceptance that you know, we are not perfect here in the United States and that we, we need to have some respect and some understanding of a culture that's 5,000 years old and, and has done fine for most of those 5,000 years without involving the United States, right? 200 years ago, India was one of the richest countries in the world before the British showed up, okay? So uh, uh, we have to take that, these nuances into account, Nina. Gunjan, no, that's, that's in, nice. Gunjan in, the, in the beginning of your, your uh, uh, presentation here, and, and it's been a great one, thank you very much. Um, you talked about this $50,000 deposit uh, in the Indian bank. Uh, was that a bribe? Oh, no, 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 that wasn't a bribe at all. This was, this was earnest money that they had to put down, you know, 
very well documented. It's a government-owned company. You can't, you know, you can't uh, put fifty thousand dollars in the, you know, in, into their bank account as a bribe. No, this was absolutely above board. The concern of my client was that it would take forever and a day to get that money back if they didn't win the business. That was their concern. There was no question that, uh, in the, even in their mind, that this was going to be something you know, improper or illegal. It was just that they didn't want to deal with the bureaucracy of trying to get a refund if they didn't win the business. I, I, I couldn't catch who that question was from uh, uh, because not everybody is showing up on my screen, but- Yeah, I, I didn't see who that, that was. That was from uh, James Pitek, right? Yes, Pitek. Pitek. Uh, okay, got All it. Right. Now we, um, speaking, staying on the side of being uncomfortable, um, we have an interesting question, uh, be, you know, because um, Russian arms sales in India has been so prom dominant in decades, um, as the U.S. increases um, its military ties with India and um, how, where do you see the prospect of those Russian sales um, going with the increased military ties with India, sorry, right. but so they're the, comfortable with the side of that. Yeah. So in, in until about the 1960s, there was not much being purchased from the, so, the former Soviet Union or what was then the Soviet Union. And then when the illustrious Dr. Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon took a very anti-India pose, India really didn't have many places to go. You know, when when Pakistan created the situation that led to, you know, uh, the separation of East and West Pakistan, the then Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, had didn't have many choices. Okay, so in the UN, UN, in the UN Security Council, she needed somebody that could hold a veto, and that country was the Soviet Union. It wasn't going to be China. It wasn't going to be. Uh, you know, the European powers. So India, uh, so this, this whole situation in Bangladesh started in late 1970, okay. Mrs. Gandhi signed a 20 year tre treaty of peace and friendship with the Soviet Union in the middle of 1971. And a few months after that, the Indian army invaded uh, what was then East Pakistan and became Bangladesh. So India was forced into that situation you know, uh, to, to be able to start buying uh, you know, uh, Soviet arms uh, and that has continued, okay? Um, even today, they are collaborating on, uh, on uh, the uh, ballistic missile programs. Uh, the reason being that while the US will sell pretty much everything to India, it is still restricting the sale of ballistic missile technology. Okay, so India has had a long-standing project called Brahmos, uh, named after the river Brahmaputra in India, and uh, and a Russian uh, river, or maybe the town of Moscow. I'm not sure, but it's called Brahmos, and uh, that is a joint collaboration to build uh, uh, ballistic missiles again for India's own protection, uh, given that there are two unfriendly neighbors on its borders. So this, uh, the, the sales, sales from Russia to India continue, although Russia is currently also selling to China, which has made India very nervous, okay? So India is buying more and more from the United States. Not all American technology is available to India. So India would like to see itself being treated the same way as NATO countries are and the same way that Israel is. That's probably not gonna happen in my view, right? So yeah, they'll buy the F-35 if they get the same F-35 that the US Air Force has, but they're not going to get that, right? So when it's a modified uh, plane that takes some key features away, they, they feel like they need to hedge their bets and uh, you know have another source. So that's kind of what has been driving this. Uh, there's been some recent, um, uh, pressure, I think, on on India to to move away from countries that the United States considers undesirable, and uh, Russia is one of them. Iran is another. Uh, India has moved some of its oil purchases 
you know, to Iraq and to the United States. Um, and the US is now one of the largest oil suppliers, oil and gas suppliers to India, uh, which of course was unimaginable just a few years ago because the US was a net importer at that time. Right? So these, these political uh, and uh, military strategic uh, things keep altering and changing, but India is not going to behave like a NATO country anytime soon, I don't think. I, I just wanted to, to ask Kunj an excellent presentation. How would you characterize business relations today between India and Latin America? I mean, I know a lot of the India farming companies rushed down and invested in Latin America early on. And a lot of them, particularly in Brazil, didn't meet with, with tremendous success and ended up going back to the sale of raw materials, API as it's called. But how would you overall uh, characterize the relationship in a commercial sense between India and, 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 and in the entire region actually? Yeah, so that's a little bit outside my area of expertise because I focus mostly on American and some European clients going into India. But I do know that broadly, India has had good relations with many Latin American countries. Uh, India is a trusted supplier of IT services to many uh, Latin American countries. Uh, consumer products, uh, you know, company like Godrej Consumer Products has, you know, vibrant businesses across many Latin American countries. I'm not so familiar with the pharmaceutical uh, efforts uh, towards Latin America. So I know that Brazil has some of the most restrictive rules you know, for foreign companies entering its uh, medical and pharmaceutical markets. That's what my clients tell me, but it's not something I've directly been focused on. So, so uh, really not much more I can say, Stephen. Thank you. I see Kathleen that you have that slide from the early part of my presentation back up, I think you're nudging me to, to answer those other questions. You got uh, it. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, I'll take that hint. Wait, wait, I think Venu has a question. Okay. Yeah, good question. Actually, uh, 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 Ganjan, first of all, thank you so much for an interesting presentation this afternoon. Uh, I mean, uh, I worked in India 15 years, uh, 12 years purely in Indian market, and I've been a continued marketing head. I launched several products in the country and I also served the United Nations from India. And then later on, I moved to the US. So I worked for IBM, KPMG, and all the kind. So I, I've been a strategic, uh, I run a strategic growth strategy consulting for both business and technology areas. Um, so, anyways, the, the key question is what kind of opportunities do you see if I were to really, you know, kind of, kind of planning to move back to India, uh, either for a board position? or an advisory role, if you will. How open are they today, given the change in the climate and the kind of learning that the Indian corporates have gone through? So how open would they be to someone yeah, to, like you a, being a board member yeah. of one of their companies? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, broadly speaking, I think they would be very open. Uh, the, the Global skills of you know being able to work in both countries are extremely valued in India, and mm -hmm. uh, you know one of the people I interviewed for my book when I wrote my book on business in India was Scott Bayman, who was the who was the head of GE India, and when he retired from there and he was on the board of a number of Indian companies, not even in the same sectors as GE used to be, but they valued his experience in you know, in understanding both countries and cultures. So yeah, I think, uh, and there are many, many other examples like that. So I think it would be, it would be wide open and Indian companies are, are now on the scale where they see that their, uh, their growth is going to come from outside of India's borders. Okay. So they've been successful enough in India and they're looking for a more global kind of plan. So they would value somebody with global experience, broadly speaking. Yeah, and uh, we shared um, the speaker's email um, in the chat, and that's a great question to uh, to ask afterwards. But yeah, we can uh, we can keep going. Thank you. Okay. So, do you want me to look at the chat, or have you taken care of everything in there? Uh, I think we've taken care of everything in the chat. Okay. Um, excellent. 
So I thought it would be fun to end on this fun note. <laughs> uh, Ravindra has a question. If it is question sure. One. Hey, um, oh. it'll take a minute. Uh, I would love for you to talk about the slide. That was what I was thinking about, Gunjan. But thank you for a very, very insightful presentation. Your presentations, as always, are very informative, very balanced, and uh, very uh, educational. So I truly appreciate it. And I appreciate the organizers putting this together. Uh, thank you for getting Gunjan on mind. Thank you, Gunjan. And tell us about self-driven cars there, Gunjan. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ravi is a good friend and he keeps me on my toes. So please feel free to disagree with my interpretation. Okay? <laughs> because in India, if, uh, if there are two possibilities, and my friend David Everhart, whom I used to teach a course on at Caltech together is also on the line. So he might, he might remember this. If there are two possible answers to a question in India and you have four Indians talking about it, they will come up with at least three right answers to, to a question that has two possibilities. Okay. <laughs> so, so Ravi, feel, feel free to, to add to whatever I say. Right. Um, so the picture on the bottom left is just, just funny more than anything. Um, you know, with all, all of this talk about self-driven cars in the US, you know, with the, you know, I own a Tesla Model S and I, I don't have self-driving on mine, but people have been talking about, you know, self-driven cars. So what's this old sign in India talking about a self-driven car? What does that mean? Ravi, perhaps you can tell the audience what that means. What's <laughs> a self-driven car and what kind of car would not be self-driven? Actually, you caught me on that particular one, good Jen. Talk about it seriously. Okay. Perhaps the driver. Uh, so, I think Nina, uh, Nina wants to uh, chime in. Nina, yes, Let please. Make a guess. You're driving so you're yourself. If you're driving, you're driving yourself, yourself. exactly. Yeah, you got it. You got so, it. So, in in, in <laughs> India, in India, until recently, if you could afford a car, you could definitely afford to hire a chauffeur to drive the car. And so, a self-driven, you know. So when you have a chauffeur. You know, and you're visiting a company, they drop you off at the door and then they go and park, you know, quarter mile away somewhere and you call them on the cell phone when you are ready to leave. Okay. But there are a lot of few places for people who have the misfortune to not have a driver and they are driving themselves so they can park closer by. Okay. That is the interpretation of self driven cars and it's also written in an Indian language, which might be Bengali. I'm not 100% sure. It yeah. says, Niji Chalit Gadi. I can read yeah. it, but uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it is Bengali. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, Venu, did you want to add something further to that? I'm sorry if I cut you off. No, no, that's fine. Actually, you know, I've, uh, it's been, I uh, know, it's a lot of nostalgia, by the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> because uh, right with that, I like, worked with, been worked with lanes and by lanes in Indian metros, launching products and uh, looking at all the kind of funny signs. Um, and uh, very fortunate to have uh, had uh, the opportunity to work with the United Nations. So I had both the, the mix of both uh, the global as well as India back and forth, right from India itself. So I could really, you know, relate to so much what you said. You've been saying part of this presentation, some of the nuances that you really mentioned. They're pretty, they're, they're, they're absolutely apt, actually, you know, they're, they're, they're correct. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I tell my clients, when you want to understand India, you're not going to understand it in the conference rooms of your vendors or your customers. You're not going to understand it in the lobby of the, you know, the Taj Hotel in India. You really have to understand it on the streets of India. You know, I yeah. remember I was on a tour with a set of defense companies and they just, you know, the, the, the group that organized this would pick us up in a bus and transport us 100 yards down to, to this other building and let us out of the bus. And we continued this for three or four days. And I was talking to the senior executive at Raytheon. And I said, you know, you're not going to learn a thing about India this way. And we finally ended up in Bangalore. And I put him in a tuk-tuk, you know, the little three-wheeler. And we went shopping in the local markets. And two years later, he told me that that afternoon he spent with me was more valuable than the entire rest of the trip. Okay, so this bottom picture, it should get you thinking along those lines, okay?
And then when you want to launch a product or a business, you're talking about at least nine different advertisements across the country, at least basically. Right. right. Uh, taking Hindi Heartland taking most of the country, but still you end up at least having nine different advertisements, um, insertions in newspapers and TV spots. Right, right, exactly. And I'll show a picture relating to that in a second. Um, that towards the end of my presentation, Kathleen, that illustrates some of the diversity. But so why would there be a tree in the middle of the road? <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> well, I'd like I'd like to see some of my, you know, American colleagues uh, take a stab at that. Nina? Because it was there first. It was there first. That's often the case. So they widened the road, but they didn't get rid of the tree, right? Okay. You know, so it seems a little absurd, right? How, how are you going to deal with this situation? What's the purpose of widening the road, right? So, you know, if you know a little bit about India, you might say, oh, it's a bureaucratic country. And, you know, the, the tree cutting department didn't talk to the road widening department. And, and so they widened the road and didn't take the tree into consideration. And now people occasionally run into the tree in the middle of the night and, you know, so be it, right? But I'm being a little unfair when I show you this picture because I took it at a time, you know, of day when there wasn't much traffic. And those of you who have been to India know that the roads are never this empty in India. And if you show up during the daytime or the evening, you will find that along the side of the road, there are roadside vendors parked, people selling product, you know, cars double parked. So that tree that looks like it's in the middle of the road is actually in the middle of, uh, you know, of, of parked vehicles. And so it's not really so much of a threat okay, as, as it might first seem. It doesn't look as absurd, you know, if you take the picture at the right time of day. I'm still not saying it's a good idea to have a tree in the middle of the road, okay? But it's, it's you know, it's less absurd when you when you take a picture at the right time of day. Really, that's the message that uh, that I'd like to have people take away. Um, Kathleen, could you go towards the end of my presentation? I just want to. Okay, show we have a, a a couple of minutes. Sure, that's fine. This should only take. Oh, okay, we have just back one. Oops. Yeah. So here's a picture of an old uh, uh, 500 rupee uh, note or bill. Uh, you know, as we say in the US, and you'll see that the word 500 rupees is written in so many different languages, okay? That's kind of illustrates the complexity and diversity of India. You know, India has more languages spoken than all of Europe does. And, you know, there's 23 official languages in India. So it's a very diverse country. And if you're selling consumer products in that market, you will, uh, you know, as Venu was saying, you know, you'll need to address uh, the, the market in, the language that the people want to speak. Now, if you're selling to the upper middle class and you're selling on Amazon, you can do English and that's fine. But if you're a company like Western Union, which offers money transfer services really to people who live in small towns across India, they don't have a single uh, ad that is in, in English. You know, they, they do all their advertising in regional languages. Yeah, so again, it depends on the kind of business you're in. 